So this morning, I'm going to uh, be speaking to you about working together to rebuild. Now, during 2020 and 2021, it's no secret that Hillside Community Church, like many other churches across North America, was subjected to a season of significant difficulty. And over the past 8 to 10 months, we've seen a shift, thankfully. We've seen a shift in the climate of things, and we're beginning to see growth, and we're beginning to see rebuilding. And I I believe that God has plans for every assembly. And for this particular assembly, I believe that God has a plan for 2023 that's going to be absolutely pivotal for the future of everyone that's here. And I've said this before, you come to this assembly, but the church is not the building, the church is not an institution, The church is the people sitting in the pews. You guys are the church, and every one of you is a part of it. And I believe God has good things in store for us. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be easy, because sometimes good things come in hard packages. And sometimes we have to wade through difficulties before we see the good on the other side of those things. So I'm not saying that God is going to give us this, you know, lay back kind of ride through 2023. We have no idea what God has in store for us, but we know it's going to be good. And um, well, this morning through the Old Testament, God has given us abundant examples of how when people stray from his will, he permits them to be tested and to be broken down, but not for the sake of being broken down but for the sake of being broken down so that they can rebuild stronger than before. In the end, when God allows us to go through trials and testing in our life, both individually and corporately, He's trying to teach us something about ourselves or about uh, our church or our family. He's trying to teach us something so that um, in the end, He wants us to surrender to Him and wants us to grow further. And and why do we exist? Why are we here? As believers, we're here to glorify God. That's first and foremost. The utmost of everything is to glorify Him in everything that we say and everything that we do. And what glorifies God is when people love Him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And people that are lost and broken come to salvation. So God saves. He delivers people from captivity, and and he heals the brokenhearted. He heals the wounds. That's what God desires, and that glorifies him. God desires that we glorify him. This morning, I'd like to touch on one example of God rebuilding after um, something was broken. And I believe that the book of Nehemiah was written and is part of the canon of Scripture because God has a specific purpose for us to look at this book and to see how He works. And um, yes, the setting of this story this morning starts in the dust and the rubble of the former well-fortified stronghold of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a stronghold in the ancient days. It was well-fortified according, uh, in comparison with other cities. It was a very well-fortified and well-situated place. But we see that the walls and the gates that went into the city of Jerusalem had been broken down and had lain in ruins since their destruction by the armies of Babylon some 130 years prior. So we're 130 years after the fact. Now, there had been, dis- there'd been attempts to rebuild the walls, and, and they just fell flat. There was, no, there, was, there was no success in that. Now, the temple in Jerusalem had been rebuilt, but the defensive fortifications that protected the people in the city were broken down, and the people were living in disgrace. The enemies of the Israelites were free to enter the city at will without any resistance 
or anyone to oppress them. Now, years prior, years prior, Jerusalem was a hub of activity and a center of power until God allowed the destruction and captivity of Jerusalem by a hostile government. He allowed that. The blame for the exile of Israel and Jerusalem lay squarely on the shoulders of the people and their leaders. Sadly, they were followers of Jehovah in name only. And sadly, their actions did not reflect a genuine commitment to wholeheartedly serving God. Despite the warnings given to the people of Jerusalem by the prophets who spake against idolatry, many of the people of the city worshipped other gods alongside of Jehovah. Their hearts were not fully towards God. And as a result, God's blessing was removed from Jerusalem. And they, dist- they, they, they suffered the destruction of their fair city, and they were sent out of their, their homes into exile, where they worked as slaves to their oppressors. In Jeremiah 32, 30 to 37 tells us the setting of how things came to be the way they were at the exile. It says, in starting with verse 30 in Jeremiah 32, The people of Israel and Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight from their youth. Indeed, the people of Israel have done nothing but arouse my anger with what their hands have made, declares the Lord. From the day it was built until now, the city has so aroused my anger and wrath that I must remove it from my sight. The people of Israel and Judah have provoked me by all kinds of evil they have done. They, their kings, their officials, their priests, their prophets, the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, they turned their backs to me and not their faces. Though I taught them again and again, they would not listen or respond to discipline. They set up their vile images in the house that bears my name and defiled it. They built high places for Baal in the valley of Ben-Hinnon to sacrifice their sons and their daughters to Moloch, though I never commanded, nor did it even enter my mind that they should do such a detestable thing and so make Judah sin. You are saying about the city by the sword, by the famine and the plague, it will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon. But this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I will surely gather them from all the lands where I have banished them in my furious anger and wrath. Great wrath. I will bring them back to this place and let them live in safety. So because of Israel's divided interest, because of their heart, serving other gods, sacrificing their children on the altars of foreign gods that were not the Lord, the city was brought into destruction and ruin. I don't know about you, but there's so many parallels to this and everyday living. When our hearts are not totally the Lord's, and we're going and doing things that aren't right, our priorities are wrong, we're sacrificing our children on the altars of things that are not godly. They're not godly. There's all kinds of things going on. God will not allow that to continue. He has to deal with that. And we find this Personally, when there's something in my life that has not surrendered to the Lord, He's going to take measures to try and break that out of me. And if I won't repent without discipline, discipline will come and He will break me. Why? Because He's too loving of a God to let me continue in a way that is not right because it leads to death. It doesn't lead to life. It leads to death. So the Israelites, in this particular case, had all these idols... They were not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord. And as a result, their enemies were, were overcoming them. And as a matter of fact, they were exiled by a hostile government and dragged off into slavery. And they were taken away from their fair city of Jerusalem and all their homes and everything, all their safety was taken away. So now, here's at the end of 130 years, this has taken its cycle. The idolatry was broken out of the people. And now, Nehemiah is called by God, along with people like Zerubbabel, who was earlier, had come with the people to start rebuilding the temple, and Ezra, who also was involved in building the temple. The the history books tell us that about 90,000 people from Israel came back to the Jerusalem area 
and into the land after this captivity period. So when Nehemiah came here to start rebuilding the walls, God was ready for them to start to rebuild. All their pride had been smashed. All the idols had been ripped away. And now it was time to rebuild his temple, a place where he is worshipped, and also to rebuild his community where the people can live in safety. Because of God's great love for his people, Nehemiah was given favor by the hostile government to be able to rebuild in the city of Jerusalem. The Persian emperor, King Artaxerxes, gave a mandate to Nehemiah that he should be able to rebuild the walls and would have the blessing of the king and the empire to rebuild. Through the first two chapters of the book of Nehemiah, we see how Nehemiah came from Susa, which was the, the big city in Persia, to Jerusalem with a, a mandate to rebuild the city walls so that the people of God could safely dwell there. In Nehemiah chapter 2, we see that after Nehemiah came into the land, the first thing he did is he went around and, and looked at the walls to see what needed to be done. So he inspected the broken down walls. He went through the rubble. It says in one point in, in chapter 2 that you know, he even had a hard time getting through one spot because the walls were just totally destroyed. They were living in complete ruin. The people that were, had been rebuilding the temple and, and their enemies were able to come in at will. So after Nehemiah inspected the walls, he came to the officials that were present there and he said this. In verse 17 he says, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about his gracious hand of my God on me, about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start to rebuild. Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat the Hornite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Gisham the Arab heard about it. They mocked and they ridiculed us. What are you doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. So, this was how chapter 2 ended out. Now, when you go into chapter 3, I'm not going to read chapter 3 because it basically breaks down all the tribes and families of people that were there and how they jumped in. They grabbed their, their shovels and their masonry sh uh, trowels and whatever they used to rebuild the walls. They grabbed them and each family took different parts of the wall and they began to rebuild. They all worked together. All of them went with one heart. And uh, in the third chapter, we see this rebuilding that occurred. And, and believe it or not, in the midst of all of this, they were able to build those walls up in 52 days. You can imagine these huge walls broken down. These people worked day and night, and they all worked together. Everyone had their part of the wall that they were responsible for. The families of Jews living in Jerusalem worked tirelessly to rebuild these broken down walls. And much of it was done under the ridiculing gaze of their enemy who mocked them and who tried their best to discourage them from rebuilding. In the story of Nehemiah's mission, there's a couple of key lessons we can apply to our own circumstances, our own mission, not just here at Hillside, but maybe in your families, maybe in your relationships. In order to accomplish God's purpose in rebuilding something safe and good, in rebuilding what has been broken down, the people of God involved in the job need to have a common vision. When it comes to rebuilding a decimated city, a marriage, a family, a church, or a community, there is only so much that one or two people can do. It must be a community effort with all hands on deck. Rebuilding what has been broken down by the enemy is not a spectator sport. It won't happen unless everybody works together. 
there is much work to be done. And everyone who's part of the family needs to be committed to the effort. The call goes out when there's brokenness that we've come from. The call goes out. Let us rebuild together. Let us find where God would have us to invest in the rebuilding of the walls. And even on a personal level, when our walls have been broken down and are in need of repair, we need others to work with us, others who have skills maybe that we don't have, but we have skills that they don't have, and we work together. We ask for counsel in places where we don't know what to do, and others ask us maybe for counsel in things that we have something to give in that they don't have expertise in. But the thing is, when everybody works together, we see this huge project come to fruition and come to completion. It's exciting because God has made us the body of Christ. Each and every one of you is a part of the body of Christ. And each and every one of you has a calling from God to do His good work. And in this particular case, with what we've seen rising from the ashes of 2020 and 2021, there is much work to be done to make this a place that is safe, where God is worshipped, a place that, 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 that has influence in the community so that others could come to know the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where would we be without Jesus? We've come through Christmas. Where would we be without grace? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. God has opened our eyes. He's given us hope. He's given us purpose. We talked about love, joy, hope, and peace that Jesus brought into the world. And we are the benefactors of that. We are the ones that God has called by name. We are the ones in this generation who is called to rise up and to be a light on this hillside so that other people might know that there is a God in heaven who saves, who delivers, and who heals, and who is genuinely interested in the brokenhearted and the beaten down people that need Him just as He was interested in us, just as He put His eyes upon us and told us that I have called you by name. I know who you are and I know what you have done, but I still love you and I call you to come to me. Come unto me, all, who you, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Weary, burdened, and heavy laden. I will give you rest. The Lord is good. See, when we're broken, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 26 to 27 says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And to develop a unified vision for what we are to do and how we, we rebuild, it's important that we develop a vision that is in line with the will of God. It's not just a matter of going and doing something that we think is good. We want to be in tune with what God wants us to do, with how God wants us to rebuild, because it is ultimately about God. It's ultimately about bringing glory to Him. God has a plan for us, yes, but it's not just about us. It's about us fitting into His plan for His glory, so that when we step out in faith, that He meets us where we are, and He does His good work in and amongst the community that we find ourselves planted in. And... When people, people catch this vision, <laughs> when people catch this vision and are submitted to the power, the, the will and the power of God, Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says this, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him and He will make your path straight. This means if we trust in the Lord wholeheartedly, He will direct our paths. He will direct our lives. He will make that building come together. He will be worshipped. He will be glorified in our community and through our community. And we will be the light in the world that He's called us to be. A city on a hill that cannot be hid.
What does this mean in practical terms? It means, my friends, we're not just going out and hitting nails on heads. We're not just going out and seeing needs and doing them, okay? Yes, we can do that, but we can end up chasing our tail if we do that. First and foremost, when we are rebuilding, we need to seek the Lord. We need to seek Him with all of our heart. And prayer needs to be at the very focus, the centerpiece of everything that we put our hands to. It's not enough just to go out doing things. It's not about just activities. It has to be bathed in prayer. It has to be led and, and, and anointed by the Holy Spirit. When we put our hands to the plow, we need God's strength and God's direction to know where to plow. You know, there, there's fields out there that are hard, and God's maybe calling us to be part of that process where those fields are plowed up. And we're not going to know those points where God wants us to plow or God wants us to plant, God wants us to water, God wants us to harvest, unless we're listening to the Master, unless we're in tune with Him. So, starting this month in January, we're going to be calling one Sunday evening per month a time of prayer for our people where we're going to meet here on a Sunday evening. And I would encourage you, when those calls are made, when, you, when those calls are, 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 are put out there collectively that we, I would suggest that it is a really good idea for us to come together and to pray corporately for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, for our community, for the needs in our community, for the people in our community, for our missionaries. There's so many think, facets of, of, of ministry that God wants us to, to bring to Him because it's all about Him. And if we try to do kids' ministry, youth ministry, adult ministry, we try to do this on our own steam and our own ingenuity, we're, we're going to miss the mark. We're not going to have... We're not going to be on the right place where God wants us to, to be in step with Him. And when we're in step with Him, great things can happen. Hmm. We know that Scripture in Chronicles, right? My friend, if you're here today, you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, maybe you've been baptized, you've been a Christian for a long time, but you're unsurrendered in parts of your life. It's time now to surrender. It's time to surrender to the Lord. Let those things go that have formerly held you captive. This is a New Year's resolution, but it doesn't just have to be a resolution. It can be a dedication. Lord, I'm calling out to you. I want you in 2023 to have everything I am and everything I have. It is all yours, God. What do you want to do with it? That, that needs to be the cry of our heart to the Father. Father, what would you have us be? What would you have us to do for you that you would be glorified, O oh God? Help me to let go of the things that I hold on to that are not pleasing in your sight. Second Chronicles 7, 13 and 14. And we've heard, up, we've heard this scripture many times. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. I'm suggesting to you this year, if you're watching stuff on that box of yours or that screen of yours that isn't right, it needs to go out the window. The Lord will give you strength to overcome, but it needs to go. It needs to go. If the priorities are wrong and you're focusing on the things of this world rather than the things of Christ, and that's your priority, your priorities need to shift. Those wrong priorities need to be tossed out the window, and we need to move into this territory that God is calling us to. And the only way that we can do it is if the Holy Spirit gives us strength to do it. But there has to be a partnership. There has to be a willingness on our part to be obedient to be holy. Be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. This is God's call out to us. And when we step forward and we say, God, take all of me, then the Spirit of God infuses us with strength and enables us with the power to do the things that are right and to step away from the things that are wrong. This is a challenge. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, 
in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, perfect, and pleasing will. If we want to have a vision from God to rebuild in the way that He wants us to, we must be committed to obedience in 2023. If we continue to live in patterns of sin individually and corporately, conforming to the patterns of this world, our mind will be cluttered with all kinds of junk and we won't be able to hear clearly God's instructions to us. We will lack discernment and we will follow the path of disobedience rather than righteousness. Should we really, and I, I'm speaking to myself, should I really, should you really be surprised? If we don't see the path forward, when our minds are constantly beset on the things of this world rather than on Christ, should we be surprised? Oh, Lord Jesus, have mercy upon us, O oh God. May your grace come to us, Lord, to be able to see you for who you really are so that our hearts would be fully yours. If we want to test and approve what God's pleasing, perfect will is, we must offer our bodies as living sacrifices in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. We must be willing to obey the Word of God because it is truth. We must be committed to obedience no matter how we feel on any given day. Feelings come and feelings go, but feelings are so deceiving. I place my trust in the Word of the Lord because nothing else is worth believing and nothing else is worth anything. If our minds are not stayed on the Word, and if the Word of God is not alive in our hearts, we're dead in the water before we even take a step. Oh God, have mercy. Help us. And Jesus, when He prayed for His disciples to become like Him, Jesus wants us to become like Him in His attitude and, his, and motivation for the, what, what we do and, and how we do things. He said this in John chapter 17, 15 to 17. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. When we walk in the truth of the word of the Lord, one thing's for certain. We can sh be sure that God will direct our paths. And another thing is certain, that we will have resistance from our enemies. It's not a cakewalk out there. You're in a battle zone. All of you are warriors for Christ. You have armor that is given to you, but don't be surprised when you step out in faith and you say, Lord, I want to do this good thing for your glory, that your enemy comes and says, what? You're rebuilding the walls? Ha! Try that. Sanballat. I like that name, Sanballat. Such a yeah, devious name, isn't it? Sanballat opposed Nehemiah. Friends, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Yes, flesh and blood might manifest to us, but they're just pawns of our real enemy. Our real enemy is the principalities and powers of darkness and high places. Don't forget it. When you're stepping out in to do something good, you're going to have resistance. Stand firm in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full, of our, full armor of God so that you might take your stand when the day of evil comes. Clothe yourselves in the armor of God because He's given it to you. He's given it to you so that you can wear it, so that you can be victorious, so that you can triumph over the circumstances. So when you say, yeah, Lord, I'm committing to you. I want my family to be committed to you. So I, th this, these areas of my life where I've struggled, I'm letting, you, letting that go. Don't be surprised if you have a mocking voice in the background. Yeah, sure. Where have you seen that before? <laughs> You've tried to rebuild and you have never been able to do it and you're never going to. Don't listen to the lies. God has made you more than conquerors in Him. No weapon formed against you shall prosper when you are yielded to the Lord. When you put on His full army, armor, doesn't matter what's coming at you, you're going to advance His kingdom and His, his gospel. So, we need each other too, right, in this journey. We need each other when we're rebuilding. 
Proverbs 11.14 says, For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. We need each other. Proverbs 15.22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. We need to come together, people. We need to hear one another. We need to encourage one another daily as we see the day approaching. Jesus is coming soon. We don't know when, but he's coming soon, and he's given us his, his uh, plan. He wants us to walk in it. Proverbs 13, 20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. Who are you hanging your hat with? I would suggest that you need to hang your hat with the people that God's placed within your Christian community. Not saying that you don't go and hang out with other people that aren't saved. As a matter of fact, that's not a good idea because it's not all about us. But we do have a family here and we do need to be committed to one another. And how are you going to get to know one another unless you spend time with one another? Unless you spend time getting to know each other. Get to know each other. Go to a group and get to know some people. Have some people over. Step out of the, step out of the comfort zone. Not just with the person you're comfortable with. That creates clicks. We don't need to be a clicky place. We need to be a place that is, that is open to see others the way Jesus sees them. I would, I would counsel you in 2023, when you come to church meetings and all that, be in prayer. God, who would you have me to go speak to today that I might encourage them? Some people come to church waiting for people to come encourage them. But God calls us to take the step and encourage others. And you know what? If everybody takes that step and they're praying, oh, Lord, today when I come to church meeting or I come to a study group or I come to an activity, how, tell me, show me, open the doors for me to be able to minister to somebody else that's there today that you have in mind. Oh, Lord, when that happens, you know what? God in His sovereignty, knows every need that you have. And you're going to be encouraged. The socks are going to be blessed off you by the next person uh, in, your, in the congregation who God has put on, who God has, has placed you on their hearts. You're not going to have to worry about your needs being met because you're going to be meeting needs and others are going to be meeting your needs because they're in prayer and God knows exactly what you need and He loves you and He loves, he loves it when His people encourage and strengthen one another. You see the, the correlation between the building of the wall? So, in closing, we can't do this alone. Jesus, our good shepherd, says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And before Jesus went into heaven, he said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he will be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides in you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And Jesus said also in John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The Spirit of God is in our midst. Why? Because Jesus has cleansed us from our sins and has saved us. If you know the Lord, He saved you, and He is in you, and He is with you. The Spirit will always guide us. The Holy Spirit will always guide us when we yield to Him to agree with the principles of His Word. He never tells us to do something that's in contradiction to His Word. And if we're praying and we're listening to the Holy Spirit, He will line things up he will, he will walk through us. You know what, folks? If your heart is, is towards the Lord, the Lord will lead you into paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He will lead you and He will guide you to the right people, to the right circumstances. You'll just, all of a sudden, you'll be in the right place at the right time. You won't have to beat your head against the wall trying in your, in your fleshly strength to do stuff for the kingdom of God. No. 
He's going to make sure you're there. It's not might not be easy. Maybe you'll you'll find that you're you're attacked, but he'll give you everything you need. He'll give you everything you need to encourage other people, to 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 pour out into the world that needs to hear the gospel. He's going to give you the words. He's going to give you the strength. He's going to give you the understanding when you need it, where you need it, how you need it, because he is faithful to his word, and that's what his word says he will do. You are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. God has a plan for Hillside Community Church in 100 Mile. We're not the only church in this community. We're not the only church in this world, but we are the place that God has called us to be, and He has got a plan his plan is good, but he calls us to be together and to be obedient. Amen? Let's work together to see the walls built. Let's pour our energies into what God has for us to be putting our hand to. Amen. Let's pray.